1996, this woman came forward to tell the Belgian authorities she'd spent her childhood years as the victim of a paedophile network. She described a world of organized sexual abuse, torture, and even murder. It was terrible. You didn't believe your eyes. And I didn't believe that humans could do that. She talked to violent child sex orgies with politicians, judges, and influential businessmen, a Belgian underworld in which the establishment has refused to believe. Regina Louf is a pathological liar. She's a woman who's invented a series of scenarios which just don't stand up. A campaign followed to discredit her evidence, but now in an exclusive interview, the policeman assigned to investigate her claims has broken his silence. He says the inquiry was blocked because it threatened to reveal too much. I'm convinced that she has been a victim, that's for sure. In June 1996, this Belgian slum revealed a bitter secret that would come to haunt the nation. The eyes of the world watched in horror. Into the light emerged two young girls. Leticia, aged 14, and Sabine, just 12, were the latest in a long line of girls who'd gone missing. Mark Dutroux, a convicted rapist and kidnapper, had led the police to where he'd imprisoned them. Relief swept Belgium as their tearful homecoming was caught on camera. But it soon turned to horror when police revealed the secret cage hidden in the cellar of Dutroux's house. The girls had been kept here, drugged and repeatedly raped. But what of Belgium's other missing children? Eight-year-olds Julie and Melissa, who were missing for more than a year, and 12 others who'd vanished mysteriously. Was this a new lead in the hunt for them? The hopes of their parents were soon dashed. Within days, Marc Dutroux led police to the site where the bodies of Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo were buried. The parents were informed, but when the Russos asked to see their daughter, Melissa, for the last time, they were refused. We begged, we were crying to see her. Really, we insisted with our lawyer, we really cried. They said, no, it's not possible, that's the law. But we said, what's the point of the law? And they said, it's for your own psychological good. It's not up to them to know what's good for our psychological well-being. What would have been good for us was to be certain. It's six years since the police unearthed the bodies of Julie and Melissa, buried in the garden of this house. What's extraordinary to me is that though Dutroux's in jail, he's never been tried for these crimes. It's as though the judicial system froze when faced with having to bring him to trial. Officially, Dutroux lived on benefits, yet this house, now derelict, was one of five that he owned. The bodies of two more missing girls were found at another, Effie Lambrex and Anne Marshall. I didn't believe that it was possible that uh, children were kept in, in a cellar 
and were raped and, and uh, kept there until that the Jew was killed, taken to prison, and that he, that we could see the cellar. At that moment, I had to believe. Before the murders, Mark Dutroux had already been convicted of five charges of rape and kidnapping. Yet somehow he'd served only six years in jail before he was released back into the Charleroi underworld. This was once Belgium's industrial heartland, but today its most famous industry is crime. Dutroux melted back into this realm of prostitution, drug traffic and stolen cars and began to plan his next project, the kidnap of children. For the parents now burying their murdered daughters after more than a year of fruitless searching, this was not the end of their nightmare. They would soon find out that Dutroux had been a prime suspect from the start, yet nothing had been done to save their girls. Melissa's father is still asking why his daughter was allowed to die. Ten days after the kidnapping of Julie and Melissa in 95, Three witnesses said it was Dutroux who's kidnapping children. But they don't go looking for Julian Melissa at his house straight after the kidnapping. It's inexplicable. And he continues to kidnap other children. They put a special surveillance unit to watch Dutroux and he continues to kidnap children. It's inexplicable. The whole thing is inexplicable from start to finish. What is known is that Dutroux was finally caught when his white van was identified. It had been used to snatch a sixth girl miles away from his home patch. The man who arrested Dutroux was Jean-Marc Connerot, an investigating magistrate. He became a national hero, uniquely respected by the parents of the murdered children. Yes, someone who wants to know the truth, you can feel it when you talk to him. You can feel that he wants to investigate, that he wants to have the truth. He is a very good magistrate. Conrad arrested Dutroux's associates. Among the first was Jean-Michel Nihoul. Nihoul and Dutroux had been seen at the site of the latest abduction the night before. They'd been in constant phone contact the day it happened. And the next day, Nihul gave £10,000 worth of drugs to an accomplice of Dutroux. One witness claimed Nihul had ordered a girl. Conorot knew Nihul had influential friends. He suspected he was the brains behind a network supplying clients with children to abuse. It's a charge Nihul denies. Conorot appealed to the public for information. When I saw him, Walking down the stairs, I thought that I knew everything about him. It was a shock. I thought, finally, they stopped him. Regina Loof was one of the first to come forward. She said that as a child, she'd been abused for many years in a paedophile network involving Nihul and Dutroux. I remember Jean-Michel Nihul as a very cruel man. He abused children in, in a very sadistic way. She says that at the age of 12, she was taken with other children to sex parties. And, she told investigators, Dutroux was there, working for Nihul. Dutroux was a boy who brought uh, drugs, cocaine or something like that, to these parties who brought some girls, or watched girls, on these parties. Nihul, he... He was a sort of party beast, <laughs> and the truth was more on the side. Nihul denies he's ever met Regina Loof, but her story's never changed. Nihul, she said, was one of those who organized the parties and invited the cream of Belgian society, judges, politicians and influential businessmen, in order to compromise them. It was big business, yeah. And it was very well organized, too. There's a lot of money going on there, and a lot of blackmail also. They had a lot of parties. They filmed it, even. So, yes, 
Yes, it exists. I know it sounds crazy. And I know that there is a big taboo on everything like that. But it exists, you know. Regina Luth's story was horrific, but her account of a violent paedophile underworld was by now reinforced by new witnesses, some of whom also named influential people. The investigation began. The witnesses' identities were protected. Each was given a code name beginning with X. Regina was X1. They went up to X9. Their testimonies became known as Belgium's X-Files. The task of trying to verify them fell to a young police investigator. They were telling stories we hadn't heard before in our lives, things we couldn't believe at the first. So we told ourselves, is this true? Could this be true? And when it is true, it's, it's very, uh, it's very, it's, it's frightening that things like that could happen. We had a special room for the interviews. It was specially equipped for people who have been victimized by such matters. There was a camera in the room. They were done mostly in the evening or the early hours. Uh, when the interviews were finished, they were written down by a few people of my team, all the way from the first word to the last, literally. But before the investigation could get underway, there was a bombshell. Jean-Marc Conrad, the man who'd arrested Dutroux, who'd saved the imprisoned girls, was sacked from the case. His removal caused a public outcry. Belgians lost faith in their judicial system. They descended on the Palace of Justice and accused the courts of colluding with the killers. The father of one of the murdered girls spoke for all. Ça revient un peu pour nous euh, à aller cracher sur la tombe de Julie et Melissa. Il y a un juge, Conrad. There's an investigating magistrate, Conrad, who arrests ten people. And they sack him and they appoint another investigating magistrate, Longlois, who's never done the job before. It's his first appointment in the most important investigation, in the biggest file of the century. You're going to put in an investigating magistrate who's never done the job before? Can you understand that? 300,000 outraged Belgians marched through Brussels in a demonstration of grief and solidarity. This white march was the largest protest the country had ever seen. Belgians felt that the dismissal of Conrad was a betrayal of Dutroux's victims, that it signaled the end of any real search for a network. The two rescued girls were overwhelmed. The country's highest legal authorities had removed the only judge in which the public had any faith because he'd attended a fundraising dinner for the families of missing children. A conflict of interest, they called it, a lack of judgment. The government feared a revolution. I think there were a kind of insurrection climate, a kind of pre-revolutionary climate here. You know, the big uh, powers in Belgium, so the magistrates uh, and the political uh, circles, the government, the parliament, everything was totally discredité. Everything was totally discredité. No one knew what to believe anymore. Rumour and speculation spawned a variety of wild theories. He will instigate ultimate fear. A feature fear. film suggested the whole affair was part of an extreme right-wing yeah. plot to destabilise the country. I'm very pleased, Victor. 300,000 idiots marching in Brussels. An ocean of white balloons. Magnificent. Pathetic and impressive at the same time. We really got them exactly where we want them.
En op verzoek van de Kamervoorzitter, de heer Raymond Langendries. To appease the public's concern, Parliament set up the Dutroux Nihol Commission. Je propose à la Commission d'observer un moment de silence. As the pressure grew more and more, they decided in a kind of panic climate to create the commission because the political world had to try to find an answer. But what the commission revealed was incompetence that beggared belief. Police had been told of Dutroux's plans to make money by kidnapping children. They had his house under surveillance throughout the abductions. They even searched inside and heard the sound of children but failed to find the dungeon. What it established beyond doubt was that the girls could have been saved. They had everything they needed to arrest Dutroux. That's the scandal of this affair. Dutroux was known. He had previous form. They had valid intelligence that he'd built the hiding place in the cellar for the little girls. There was information from Chalois that the children could be at the house. But when the Parliamentary Commission began to ask why, was it incompetence or had someone in authority protected Dutroux, cooperation with their investigation stopped. It was completely sabotaged to the point that all the work they did has been locked away in archives for 30 years. It was Parliament that voted that on itself. Can you imagine? If the Commission's job had been to restore stability, to clear the air of insurrection, it worked. The danger to Belgium's establishment was over. But there was still no answer to the most important question. Was the catalogue of failures pure incompetence? Or had Dutroux and his friends enjoyed protection? Were they protected? On the question of protection, we didn't discover much, unless you count the best protection that Dutroux could have had, and that's the incompetence of Belgium's police and judicial system. But Jean-Michel Nihoul, the man suspected of hiring Dutroux to kidnap children, was released from jail after just five months. It's still unclear if he'll ever come to trial, and some members of the commission remain convinced he is protected. We succeeded in demonstrating that Niul was really an artist in protection, really a specialized man in manipulate, manipulating inquiries, policemen and judges. We had proofs about, about that. Nihul's release just left more unanswered questions for the families. The mother of Melissa, Karine Rousseau, has access to the legal evidence the court will bring against Dutroux. She's found no answers, nothing to clarify who stole, raped and killed her daughter. All charges Dutroux denies. Five years on, there's still no admission from Dutroux. There's no material evidence, no witness statements, which state that it was Dutroux who really kidnapped the children, who really raped them, and who really killed them. It's a catastrophe because nothing is any more clear today. Nothing is clear. The parents suspect Dutroux was not acting alone, that others were involved in abducting and hiding the girls. When he was briefly imprisoned for car theft in November 1995, Dutroux claims to have left the girls in his cellar, in this specially constructed cage, with a little food and water. On his release, after nearly four months, Dutroux claims he found the children barely alive, that he tried to save them, but they died in his arms. But for the Russos, this story can't be true. Four months incarceration of two little girls of eight years old in a cellar in the middle of winter. But when I say cellar, it's a little hide built inside the cellar, 
so it's tiny, three meters by two, even less. No windows, completely dark, they cut off the heating. They cut the electricity and heat. And no food for four months. Then he says when he came out of prison four months later, they're still alive. Well, then they're superhuman. It's unimaginable, two children of eight holding out, alone, with nothing to sustain them. No food, no heat, no human, no psychological contact, nothing. In a little cage like that for such a long time and survive. So how did they survive so long? Did someone else keep them alive? The Palace of Justice in Liège is the seat of one of Belgium's most powerful figures, Prosecutor General Anne Tilly, who's in charge of the case. She says there's no evidence to contradict Dutroux's version of how the children died. So how did the children survive so long, nearly four months, until Dutroux was released from prison? No, no, Julie was dead. Julie était morte. Melissa was nearly dead, and then she died. I think it was the next day. But Melissa, how could she have survived nearly four months? Survive in what condition? In a lamentable state. She was so weak she could not get up. That's according to Dutroux, of course. No one else was there. Dutroux was acting alone. This is the mantra repeated again and again in Belgium, with a certitude that for the victim's parents is inexplicable. They believe that investigators have blocked every lead, rejected every clue which would reveal that Dutroux was kidnapping girls for someone else. Most painful, perhaps, is the autopsy report which shows Melissa had been repeatedly raped about two weeks before her death, while Dutroux was in jail. So who raped this child? Dutroux denies he raped the girls. But isn't it simple to find out if Dutroux raped them or someone else, scientifically? Normally, yes. In principle, yes. But in fact, the most elementary scientific tests, like DNA tests, the traces of the culprit on the body of the child were just not done. Back in the Palace of Justice, they say the DNA tests were done, but the results were inconclusive. Can you explain why there was no DNA analysis done? DNA analysis was done, madame. And the results? Nothing. What does that mean, that there was no trace of sperm? They were in a very putrefied state. It did not allow us to make an analysis of that type, of sperm or anything. That's not what's written in the autopsy report. Again, the story doesn't square. The bodies weren't severely decomposed. DNA can be identified from samples taken long after death. The question remains unanswered. Why is there no DNA result? Might it have shown that someone else had raped Melissa? Other forensic tests that should have been routine were just not done. Human hairs collected from Dutroux's dungeon weren't sent for analysis. The logic was strange. They claimed that as there was no evidence anyone else had entered the cage, there was no need to analyze the hair. In five years, Connerot's successor has shed no light on the abduction, imprisonment or death of the girls. Jacques Langlois refused to be interviewed. Langlois don't believe in a sort of network. For Langlois, the Dutroux is the only one who used the girls. For, du, for, for Langlois, it's... Uh, uh, it's simple. There's one raper. The true. And closed case. By the spring of 1997, evidence of a paedophile network linked to the Dutroux affair was emerging from the testimony of the ex-witnesses. 
Regina Loof had provided investigators with details of her childhood abuse, which they'd begun to check. In one of her testimonies, she explained how a certain person had been murdered in a certain place. So uh, we went to look for that case, that old case. Uh, she, she described it, where it happened, more or less. I remember it like it's a film in my head. I can close my eyes and see every little detail of that house she, were where she was murdered. Regina Loof described a house where in 1984 she said she saw the torture and murder of a young girl. The house was connected to an underground mushroom farm. The building has since been demolished, but Rudy Hoskins' team identified it and matched Regina's story to an unsolved murder, that of 15-year-old Christine Van Hees. She gave us some details that made us think that it's impossible to give without having been there at that place or without having yeah, lived that in the way the body was found at that time and the way she described the person was, was, was killed. There were some things that were similar. It was a sort of bondage, so her legs and her hands and her throat were connected with the same rope and when she moved, she strangled herself, yeah. The credibility of Regina Loof's testimony hinged partly on whether she really knew the house where Christine Van Hees was killed. This man grew up there, though his family sold it before the murder. It was two houses knocked into one, with a unique passage of stairs and corridors. No one, he says, could describe it unless they'd been there. There was the corridor here, between the two houses and she drew a picture of the doors inside. They were antique doors, and she drew the mouldings. She described the wallpaper and the front step. I don't know how she could have described it all so faithfully if she'd never entered the house. I don't know Regina Loof. I've never even met her. All I know is, from her description of the house, of the mushroom farm, my brother and I agreed. I'm sure it's certain she entered the mushroom farm. It's certain. The police were now convinced they were onto something, that Regina Loof's testimony was credible. What's more, it gave them a new link between Marc Dutroux and the man accused of being his boss, Jean-Michel Nihoul. In the year before her death, Christine Van Hees was a regular visitor to the Brussels ice rink, where Marc Dutroux also went. He'd already been banned from the rink in Charleroi, where he was notorious for molesting girls. The manager remembers it well. And then I saw him with a young girl who was up against the lockers like this. And Dutroux, who was in front of her with his hands all over her, like this. So I grabbed him and pulled him back and brought him over here. At that moment, my father-in-law turned up, and when he found out what was happening, he wanted to hit him. So I grabbed his arm, otherwise he would have punched him. When she wasn't skating, Christine Van Hees used to spend time in the building of a pirate radio station. It belonged to Jean-Michel Nihoul. Both men, Dutroux and Nihoul, were at Christine Van Hees's murder, according to Regina Loof. And who was involved in the murder? He watched it, and it didn't do something, anything. And so he abused her that night. So, yes, he was involved. How many people were there? I still don't know for sure, but around eight. Nihu, Dutroux. And a lot of others. So. But everybody except Dutroux is free. Nihu denied it, but her testimony was dynamite. If true, 
It meant Dutru and Nihul were linked with another murder. But then out of the blue, the investigation was stopped. We received a message that we couldn't investigate anyone just like that. We were sent home. Just like that. Without an explanation. Because our work hasn't been done all right. A very strange. Why were you taken off this case? I wish I knew. Perhaps you were touching something we, we, we couldn't touch. Some people say this. Uh, we didn't have to prove at that moment to, to say things like that. But perhaps we were coming closer to some things, uh, yeah, perhaps. Like what things? I know something uh, Belgium or the world shouldn't know about. Patrick de Batz, the head of Hoskins' team, had been one of Belgium's most respected police investigators. It was he who'd taken Regina's testimony. Now he too was sent home, accused of manipulating her evidence. Patrick de Batz, who questioned her, mm -hmm. was accused of planting some of the information mm -hmm. so that she would reproduce it. You watched that investigation. Mm -hmm. Was that true? No, no way. No way. But we even had some um, magistrates, judges, and superior John Amory officers watching how we interviewed, and they watched it from the first to the last moment. And if we did, haven't done it right at that time, they should have said us, don't work that way. But they didn't tell us anything. For de Batz and his colleagues, charged with manipulating an inquiry, a Kafkaesque battle now began to clear their names. They were suspended, and Regina Loof got a call from a member of the new team assigned in their place. His motive was clear. He said, well, we have to search for uh, mistakes you made now. And it's, you have to prove now that you are right. And I said, no, I don't have to prove that I'm right. You have to investigate if I'm right or not. I'm not a police officer. I can do house search and, and I can't interrogate my abusers. You have to do that. I just can tell my story and, 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 and make testimony. That's all I can do. And said, wrong. You have to prove it. News about Regina's story began to leak out. When the media took it up, it was to destroy her. X1 et ce fantasme, une enquête au-delà du réel. Madame, Monsieur, bonsoir. L'affaire du trou s'est enrichie. The flagship program of the government-funded French language channel was unequivocal. De Batz was guilty, they declared, and Regina Louf, a sinister and deranged liar. I think Regina Louf is a pathological liar. She's a woman who's invented scenarios that don't stand up to scrutiny. It's all been shown to be fiction. Well, no, not according to the investigators who were sacked. They don't agree with you. They say they weren't even allowed to investigate. That no, that's stopped. not accurate. I continue to believe these men did not do their jobs properly and that they let the public think that what Regina Louf and the other anonymous witnesses said was partly true. That's all a tissue of lies, stories verging on the pornographic. They make no sense. Weren't you manipulated? I mean, people have said she was completely mad. She invented the whole thing. Mm -hmm. well, some people uh, uh, yeah. Some people say this, but they weren't there. We lift all the testimonies. We've seen them. We did the investigations. So uh, for ourselves, we know what should have been right or what could have been wrong. But when you don't, when you haven't lived it, when you haven't seen everything, you can't give an opinion on this. It's impossible. But we found some things that should have been investigated more. I'm married for 13 years. I have four children. I live a normal life. I have a business of my own. So I'm not crazy. We are labeled as crazy. We have a stigma. We are stigmatized as crazy persons because 
we had the courage to talk about things that happened in our past with persons who played a role in the Belgian economy or, or politics or something like that. It was easier to, to make us crazy than to believe us. Despite its earlier investigating zeal, Belgium's parliament now stood by as Regina Louf's testimony was declared worthless. The judiciary announced it would not be used in any trial. And that might have been the end of it had the files of the entire Dutroux investigation not been leaked. Marie-Jeanne van Heeswijk and two other investigative journalists had access to every witness statement, every police report in the Dutroux affair. Their book on Belgium's X-Files shook the country. How did you get the information for the book? We had the opportunity to see the whole police file on the, the affair. And um, the problem is that we wanted to be sure that there was no manipulation between, behind that. Um, because it's, it's always possible. So. We decided to meet um, a lot of people who were named in the files, who were witnesses in the file, and um, we met those people um, without saying that what we knew already, and we listened to their story. They found the new team had rewritten Regina Loof's original statements. Testimony had been changed. We began to check it. And we began to read again all the questioning of Regina Louf to see how they did that, they rewrite that. And one by one, we discovered that gendarmes, colleagues of the bats, had pretended that the bats manipulate, had manipulated the investigation. So everybody was tricked. To this day, no evidence has ever been produced to support the allegations against de Batz. Yet, he continues to be accused. I met him and his colleague in a Brussels cafe. Their careers are in ruins, and the investigation into Regina's story is dead. And yet, two separate inquiries cleared them of every charge that they manipulated her testimony. The inquiry. I show you the final report of the inquiry of the gendarmerie. It was made the 26th June 2000. So what does this mean? I'm not a bad policeman. But now that's cleared you, you yeah. face new new charges, new allegations, new accusations against afraid. you. I'm not afraid of that. Because I know the conclusions will be the same. But why this constant barrage of accusations? I don't know. I can imagine things, but uh, I can't explain them. For six years, the parents of the murdered girls have grappled with the inexplicable. Why were their daughters left to die? Why has Dutroux never come to trial? And why has every lead that might have revealed a network behind Dutroux been blocked or ignored? But Belgium's lost interest in their struggle. Today, anyone who talks of a network, even the parents, is dismissed as deranged. I talked in press about uh, children who were uh, raped and so on. And they started again with saying that I'm a little bit foolish and that I'm fantasizing. I'm sure that uh, in uh, uh, several years, uh, everyone will believe that uh, networks will exist. Then they have to accept. Since Mark Dutroux's arrest, anyone who's questioned the official line has been attacked. Every lead that might have widened the net has hit the buffers. Dutroux, meanwhile, has sat in jail. But outside, in the shadowy circles in which he moved, potential witnesses in the Dutroux affair have died in strange ways. A police informer with links to the Charleroi underworld, José Stepp, told a journalist he had explosive information on Dutroux. Two days before they were due to meet, he died. 
his family believes he was poisoned. Jean-Paul Tamineau was up to his neck in the Charleroi underworld of stolen cars and prostitution. He was summoned to see the Charleroi police and disappeared. The day of Dutroux's arrest, his foot was fished out of the canal. It's quite a coincidence that they <laughs> died just before they want to testify, you know? That's strange. Social worker Gina Pardons worked with abused children. She'd identified the paedophile members of a pornography ring who'd threatened her. When she reported the threats to the police, she was killed in an unexplained car crash. Francois Raiskins told a friend he'd seen one of the missing girls, Melissa, alive in Holland. Before he could tell the police, his body was found crushed on the railway line. Some 20 people, all potential witnesses in the Dutroux affair, have died in mysterious circumstances. I survived it all. I don't know why, but... I survived my abuses, I survived my testimony just because I said it all. Why kill me now, you know? I'm mad. An uneasy peace has returned to Belgium. The streets are calm. The danger of insurrection has passed. The paedophile networks persist. Sometimes there are even arrests. Earlier this year, 19 men from one village were charged with child rape. But the true affair has paralyzed Belgium's judiciary. After six years in jail, there is still no date for his trial. When it comes, it'll satisfy no one. The trial of Dutroux, it will be a theater, a circus. And uh, I don't want to be part of the circus. The truth is that there is a network and that they have to search for that network so that you can save other children in the future. In this country, we will never get to the truth. There is just too much truth that needs to be exposed. I'm certain that the people want to understand. They're capable of understanding a lot more than the politicians and judiciary want to tell them. They treat the public like children. I did what I could do. I testified. I spoke up to the police, to the judges. I spoke up to the press. You know, I yelled it out. What can I do anymore now? I can't. Children continue to go missing in Belgium. Dutroux's arrest has made no difference. Last year, it was more than 2,000. 52 of those cases remain unsolved. A link of Frank Hill is live online now. Express your opinions and email her.